Uh, so this is uh, Friday, June 4th, 2021, the first of, I don't know, at least two today, conversations about what to, what to show people who are interested in the next, the next economy, the next society, whatever that might, whatever it might be. Um, and Graham is really funny because we, we started an hour ago and uh, he was like, I'm a little, if I seem a little distracted right now, it's because 10 minutes ago across the street from me, a building lit on fire. Okay. Um, and so he was like, at first he didn't see any fire engines, but he could hear some sirens in the background. And then, you know, halfway through our call, I'm like, so how's the fire doing? And he says, well, now there's water arching over the building. But he was, he was seeing, <laughs> flame, he was seeing flames shoot out of a warehousey building uh, wow. near him. So, so that was exciting. Yeah. How are you all? I'm good. I also want to ask you, I think Gil also mentioned a call like a philosophical type conversation. I'm really interested in getting that on the calendar. I just don't know what the protocol is to push for it. <laughs> um, we talk and then I'm, I, I, we look at calendars and we like the easiest way is we make a date to have that conversation. We frame the conversation in a way that's appealing to others. And then we post it on the Mattermost and on the Google group and say, hey, come join us. Okay. Um, and, and which, so, so a piece of what I'm hoping we do here is have that, uh, some of that philosophical conversation. So that, that I don't know whether uh, where I'm aiming actually will fulfill a piece of what you're, you're thinking about. Uh, I'm hoping it does because, because a piece of this is like, what are the big ideas that are different from today's conventional wisdom that are actually product will productively take us into a better future, right? And yeah, I and think who's it's, I'm interested well. in local in in like the whole local economy tie-in kind of thing. Yeah. And actually, there's one more thing I wanted to say. You guys, I heard a frustration with not getting enough women here. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was thinking of is that like there are certain people like do you know um Michelle Holiday, her work only by name. Okay, so there are certain people that I think maybe if we took the time and sent an invitation to them specifically, you know, come for, you know, talk about your work for 10 minutes, you know, just a few minutes, yeah, just yeah. to introduce, I think that would be a better way because there's, oh. <laughs> so here's Michelle in my brain. I'm just, uh, while you're talking, I just looked her up <clears throat> and she's Thriveability Montreal. She used to work at Coke. Um, I apparently like her thinking because back when I ran Rex, I was thinking of, of contacting her to ask if she might want to be a, a Rex okay. fellow. So I think I'm very on board with her thinking and I have not invited her to anything or contacted her. So, so that would be my suggestion as a place to start. And I think she's fabulous. I really do. Fabulous. That's a great idea. Thank you, Stacey. You're welcome. Um, and why don't we use the calls channel in Mattermost for our notes? Um, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, so I'll just put a marker in there. When we get off this call, I will practice getting on to there because I, I also wanted to ask you, how do I get to Trove? Uh, so I'll give you a link to Trove right now. There's a, Thank and, you. and he's renaming it. It used to be called Catalyst but he ran into a name conflict around Catalyst. Uh, so the easiest thing I think I can give you is an invite to OGM on Catalyst, which is becoming Trove. And okay. this, this invite, which I will put, I'll, uh, oh, that's right, I'll put it in the Zoom chat because you're not apparently on the Mattermost chat. Uh, so this should get you uh, signed Thank up, you. signed up okay. on Catalyst slash Trove. Okay. Howdy, Thanks. Hank. Uh, hello, good at, hello, well, hello. Good morning to you. Good afternoon to me. Exactly. Uh, well, good night to Craig. He's, uh, oh, where where you. are you from, Craig? I'm from Scotland, but I'm living in Thailand. Ah, right. Okay, good. <clears throat> so I'm a few hours ahead. Each right. day. We're, represent we're representing all <laughs> parts of the day. Terrific. Yeah. In fact, you, Craig, you could almost make the 4 p.m. call because you'd be waking up maybe. I don't know what time. My, yeah, what, my 4 p.m. is what time for you? That'd be 6 a.m. 6 a.m., so if you're an early riser. It depends how, how late I work of an evening. Yeah, exactly. Um, Jerry, apropos uh, opening up OGM. Yes. And finding uh, uh, new ethnic groups and multiple genders and so on. 
Um, so I just did a, uh, a Google search for black discussion groups. Mm -hmm. uh, I did one earlier today and I've lost that. So I did another one now and I just posted them. There's a Facebook page, um, Black Intellectual Discussion Forum. That's what BDIF is. Wow. BDI. Um, now I'm reluctant to, to click on it because if mm -hmm. I go to Facebook, they will restart my account and I'm oh, trying right. to get shot of it. So I posted the link there. It just strikes me. I mean, there are people in groups like ours of all ethnicities mm -hmm. all over the world. You know, in some of the other meetings I, uh, I frequent, we have uh, participants from Ghana and Nigeria and Singapore, Australia, men, women, elderly, youngsters. We've got Gen Z and everybody is in many, many of these groups. Mm -hmm. um, so it strikes me there's uh, there's uh, uh, loads of places to go looking for people to to. Uh, <clears throat> to case <laughs> perhaps to observe first and then perhaps invite to uh, to OGM or join a discussion with them and, and present yourself or oneself uh, with you. a view to inviting them to uh, uh, to OGM because I saw someone posted in the in the Matamos chat yesterday um, that we uh, who was it and he wanted he wanted to he wanted to contribute a hundred dollars mm -hmm. to pay for uh, a diversity uh, expert to come in and, and advise us. Assistance from someone who's going to advise us to do things that we've already got suggestions for and haven't made any effort to follow up. Good point. Um, and I'll I'll let me just share <laughs> screen again because I just added Michelle Holiday to a thought that I've been curating called potential OGM co-conspirators. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, there we go. So uh, here's just A through B, right? There's a, there's a scroll bar up here. So I've got a whole bunch of people in this thought and the little, the little lock icon below it means that uh, this is a private thought for me. This is not a thought that I'm sort of putting out in public. So if you go browse my brain, if I give you a, a I, I can't actually give you a link to go find this because it's only visible to me. I could make it public, but it didn't seem quite right. But here are a whole bunch of people doing really interesting work. And I just added Michelle because Stacy brought up Michelle. Um, and I have made I have made zero effort to reach out to these potential co-conspirators. So, mm -hmm. you know, Bibi Wunderman, uh, Adebay, uh, Bayo Akumolafe, uh, Adrienne Marie Brown. There's a whole, you know, he's a, he's a public intellectual all about post-activism and sacred activism. And Frankly, this is a really good entry point to the conversation I intended to have now and, and this afternoon, because if these people have good videos, like here, here's one that I found, but I don't know that I watched it. Um, it's like uh, the times are urgent, let us slow down, slowing down intentionally, that's his, his, his conversation. But, um, but approaching these people and picking the ones who are not white males would be a really great strategy for, for broadening out our, our uh, community. And then, <clears throat> I have connected to it this other thought, which is public. So um, in fact, uh, in fact, Stacy, uh, one of the things that you may be able to find in Trove, uh, because I exported, what I did was I exported all the thoughts that are connected to OGM neighbor communities. And then Vincent imported that into Trove. Uh, and I think that he, I think that the OGM group is seeded with some of this information in Trove, in his database, in his directory. And so here I have uh, Game B, uh, Artificial Brain Network Notebook app, uh, uh, a whole bunch of efforts on bridging the cultural divide, Braver Angels, uh, uh, Beyond Connecting the Dots. There's a whole, and again, this is just A through C here, but there's a whole bunch of communities that we have made no effort to approach, right? And, and for me, one of the best ways to increase diversity in OGM is not so much to convince people who are more diverse than us to come join our conversation, but rather to be of service to people who are more diverse than us. And, and in so doing, hopefully they'll come join our conversation because when we jam here, good things happen for them in, in the, the problems they're trying to tackle. And I think mm -hmm. that that orientation 
I haven't tried to engineer, I haven't sort of convinced us to do, I haven't built time into our program. You know, this, this is an interesting thing. The call that I set up here, I just did on spontaneously yesterday, figuring short notice, we'll see who, who, who sees it and, and, can, and can show up. Uh, but we can do lots of these. And Stacy, the, the, the philosophical conversation you'd like to have is, is interesting in that same exact way, right? And, and one thing I haven't done is kind of flood our schedules with lots of different interesting, chewy, tasty um, kind of calls like this that are OGME. And then just to compound things, because we don't have like a shared infrastructure, because the OGM platform, whatever that is, doesn't exist yet. And it's just me out here still with the brain, which is proprietary. And then other people using Miro and whatnot, because, because the piece parts aren't connected behind the curtain. Um, as we do all these calls, we're not busy building a shared asset, a shared knowledge base of what these things are, who these people are. So when I just showed you my potential OGM co-conspirators thought, I would love for that to be a social thought where, uh, you know, where you could, could say, hey, here's the people I think would be really interesting to bring into this conversation who are doing work that's resonant with what OGM is about, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I could like say, yes, yes, borrow, borrow. I don't know about this one, but, and then each of our points of view on that question would be preserved, right? Which is, which is one of the goals of an OGM infrastructure It's not, it's not to homogenize everybody's perspectives and ideas like Wikipedia needs to do to be a, an a canonical encyclopedia, but rather to have shared resources that preserve individual points of view so that we can contrast, compare, and improve our points of view, right? And then build together sort of the thing here. Here's the batch of things we agreed on. And then here's the still kind of touchy contentious issues. And here's how we're going about exploring them. And, and we're still in the dark, like with the tools part of this. And Pete has been building out Massive Wiki, which is sort of our default platform, which is really primitive at this point. I mean, it's, it's markdown files uh, that can smell like a wiki if you know how to shake the stick in the right way. Um, so, so we're a year into this and still kind of floundering, but these are the kinds of things that I'm realizing we need to sort of move forward with. Did that all make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's good. Yes, it did. Gary, <laughs> um, uh, do you have a, a link to the uh, Mattermost uh, conversation? I do indeed. Let me go back to Mattermost and pick up a link to this, to the calls yeah, channel. Yeah, got it. Got it right. And mm -hmm. paste it into our mm -hmm. chat. Oh, oh, that's it. Exactly. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. That's the one. Um, and, and so... Uh, Maybe I should go back and reframe this question as, I, as I'm setting it up for today's calls. Or should we, or, or are there any things, any other things to talk about before I do that? Mm -hmm. Sounds good, let's go there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so, so the idea is you bump into somebody who's maybe center right, like slightly conservative, but not QAnon. Um, and they're curious and interested in like, what's going on and what the big change of foot is. They're, they don't need to be convinced that things are screwed up, that, that you know, I, I'm trying to avoid um, beating the drum of everything's broken, we're all going to die, uh, and trying to figure out who's got really interesting, positive, possibly radical uh, suggestions about moving forward, um, who is sort of disrupting the status quo by thinking differently about the fundamental assumptions. So the call I just got off, uh, uh, when Craig joined, I was talking to Graham Boyd, who's the inventor of Fair Shares Commons. And he's written a book about this and he's, he's got seminars and a couple of OGMers, Trey, uh, Trey Ashley uh, Guerin and uh, Parmjit have been taking his seminar and working with him uh, to learn the, the, the Fair Shares Commons stuff. And a piece of what happens in Fair Shares Commons is that profits are pooled and then shared back out, which means that all of the entities, all of the little sovereign entities that are in the Fair Shares Commons have a much higher survivability rate. And so part of our conversation just now was, there's, there's a metaphor here of why the casino usually wins, which is the casino has deeper pockets than everybody else. And what wipes out small gamblers is that they run out of their funds. And what wipes out little companies is they hit a couple quarters where they drain their runway and they don't get another round of financing or debt or anything like that. And they're out of, they're out of the game. And so that's why there's so many small business failures, et cetera, et cetera. So fair shares, one of its benefits is 
it, it creates a much sounder platform for the survivability of small initiatives that, until they actually get lift off, which is cool. And he, he also said, he, part of his thesis also is that luck plays a much bigger role in company success than we ever attribute uh, to it. That, that, that really so much of this is like rolls of the dice. And if you can survive lots of rolls of the dice, your odds of, of success are much better. So, so, so that's interesting because he's undermining a bunch of conventional assumptions about economics. And one of the things I recommended to him on the call in the last hour was, hey, maybe you frame this as an antidote to the Laffer curve. Because Arthur Laffer was an economist whose work is really not based on a lot of facts, but Ronald Reagan seized on Laffer and made him like an important economist and used the Laffer curve to sell everybody trickle down economics. And trickle down economics says, which is dogma for Republicans right now. If you, if you give tax cuts to big companies and, and wealthy individuals, they spend more money and that money trickles down the economy to all the poor people who then make a better living. And it turns out, it turns out at least from my own perspective, that this is bullshit thinking. It's a great way to convince everybody that tax cuts are okay. And in fact, the far right has convinced everybody that, that any, all kinds of taxation is taking. This is one of the things I hate about libertarian thinking is that they think that all taxes are, are illegal takings uh, and they have no concept of the commons, no concept of, 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 of other, other sorts of things. And again, this is just my own, my own point of view on these things. Um, and I would love, I would love to do um, virtual combat with libertarians and Hayekians and other sorts of people with tools like the brain and Kumu and Miro and whatnot. I'm looking forward and maybe this is a year ahead now uh, from where we are today because of the tools, but, and I haven't found like a libertarian who's built a body of work like I built with the brain because you kind of need something to show and tell with uh, to do this. But I would love to be in, in, in a place where we can have these conversations thoughtfully, slow them down a little bit and then put up, okay, so here's a, here's a question we think we framed nicely what are some experiments that, that we can find out if anybody's run? Uh, what can we suggest to economics postdocs as courses of study and, and cross our fingers that somebody picks one up and goes and actually, actually performs this research <clears throat> or whatever, right? So how, how, might, how might we become part of the frothy conversation that is all too often this combative, com combative conversation around big ideas that have little underpinning, that have, that have poor foundations, right? Um, so that's part of the goal here. So, so this conversation, and I keep drifting back toward this, the broader purposes of open global mind, but, but this little brainstorming, I'm hoping, I'm, I would love to uncover a series of, and I'm, I'm aiming for relatively short because there seems to be like this incredible Jurassic explosion or Cambrian explosion, sorry, of, of uh, like long form podcast conversations that are an hour and a half and, and clubhouse chats that are not recorded that are six hours long and stuff like that. And I'm like, um, nobody you're talking to and trying to convince of something is gonna sit and listen to something for an hour and a half or 1% of those people will be willing to sit through an hour and a half. But lots of people have an appetite for three minute, six minute, 10 minute bites. And one of the reasons TED talks are, are like no longer than 18 minutes is that they realize that A, you can force somebody to say an awful lot in 18 minutes. Yeah. And there's a couple of TED Talks where I look up and I realize that we're only four minutes into the talk and I have learned a ton. And I'm like, how did they compress so much so well, right? Uh, and then there's other TED Talks where I'm 12 minutes in and I'm like, is this person ever going to say anything, right? Um, and, and so how do we find the shiny nuggets? How do we find the insightful ones? And in particular, the radicals, the, the disruptors, the ones who are thinking against the grain, uh, but, but whose thinking makes a lot of sense. And I've got some examples of this and I just, I, I, I would love to find many more and I would love to make that library, playlist, whatever, publicly available uh, and see if we can't crowdsource continually building it. Uh, so that it gets easy to say, hey, if you're curious, just knock on the door over here and then just follow your instincts through the materials that are there. You seem to have quite a collection of videos there already in, in, in the brain, Jerry. I've got some. <laughs> let, me, let me share the screen there. Um, let me just go back to it and go to uh, sorting out the future. <clears throat> Uh, and I put, I put the, this link under the videos so as not to make it a super category, but just under. 
Uh, and then there's a bunch of really different things. So depression and anxiety, uh, the feminine economy. Uh, and I'm realizing that um, ba -ba 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 -ba, Max Lee, I'm forgetting her last name, Liberois, something like that. Um, but I just, two or three days ago, I was captivated by this short video, which I will find in a second if my brain search function is happy. And I had a little bit of a brain search error earlier today, so it may not be Liboiron. There we go, Liboiron, there we go. Uh, so Max Liboiron uh, does citizen science. Um, she's working on pollution from plastics. And then she has this video, which I really loved, on how Max Liboiron is changing how science is done. Um, in which she talks about um, how she is doing citizen science and is being of service to communities. And she goes into communities that are like, like fishing communities that are affected by plastics. And she asks them what they need how, and, and how to do things. And the reason why she's researching ocean plastics is that she has this quirky personal habit where she likes tackling really difficult problems. And several years ago, somebody said, well, why is nobody measuring how much plastic is in the oceans? And she's like, well, because that's impossible. And then, and, then, and then that thought stopped her. And then a month later, she redirected her, all her research and all her activities. And she founded the, a CLEAR, the Civil, Civic Laboratory for Environmental Action Research, uh, which invented a series of trawls, basically things you can drag around and then collect up and measure to trawl for plastics in the ocean, for example. So they have a baby legs trawl, <clears throat> which you can assemble yourself with some, uh, some bo bo bottled water bottles of plastic and a kid's, uh, a kid's uh, tights. Basically you attach to the bottom and you staple this whole thing together and you drag it behind your boat or whatever, or through your river and you pick up and count what you captured. And that's a, that's a, a, a kind of citizen science. So, so I think that that's not specifically about how politics is changing. But for me, it's a really nice example of how science needs to change and how we can find our way to facts together and also about science in service to humans in built in towns. So I loved all that about it. So I'm, I've just, I've just, by making the link here, I've just added it to uh, the, the collection that I have. Um, and then I have one link here on why Bitcoin is so bad for the planet. I have a funny one, uh, SNL a couple weeks ago did an explanation of NFTs, <clears throat> of non-fungible tokens. It's, it's, it's all mod, like hip hoppy kind of funny music video. It's a really good explanation. Like it's a really good explanation of NFTs. So, and, and to me, humor is bonus points. Like if you can do, if you can do something serious and funny, it's awesome. Uh, so similarly, I put in just for grins, uh, have you all seen the Amazon Silver Edition video? No. Yeah. Oh my God, you're missing out. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put this link uh, in, let me stop sharing so I can grab the link more easily. Uh, but I'll put the link in our chat uh, right this yeah. minute because uh, they, did a, they did a skit where it's like, uh, you know, it's Alexa for seniors. And uh, they, for, of course, the, all the seniors forget her name. So it's uh, Cassandra. You know, they, they call her by everything. And then, and then all the things that seniors do, they start doing, but Alexa Silver Edition has been programmed to just re respond with, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yeah, uh-huh. And, and that's one of the funny parts of it. So uh, totally worthwhile. But, but a couple bits of humor in the collection are, are helpful as well. Um, so let me pause and see where you wanna go because, because I think a stimulus for this conversation is what are the big questions about the horizon? Like as we look ahead into the great transition, which is one of the phrases for the big change, right? And there's the, there's the great transition initiative, there's uh, transition towns, there's a whole bunch of movements just around that phrasing. Um, one of the questions is, what if everything becomes free? Another question is, what if robots automate everything and we're all out of work, but, but there's no social net? Another question is, what if we have abundant energy? Right. What, what if, and if you look at the cost of the, the price of photovoltaics, photovoltaic cells, the cost, the cost of solar has plunged, mm. plunged. One of the funniest, um, one of the funniest charts to see, and I've seen this in a couple of presentations, is about the International Energy Commission's predictions about so the cost of solar. 
And so every year they do a new, a new forecast and their forecasts all are aligned like this, you know, forecast here, forecast here, forecast here. The actual is this plunging line. The, the actual year to year is this line where the cost of photovoltaic just fell like dramatically. And, but every year along that line, their forecast is like the same stupid linear extrapolation. They, they didn't seem to understand that, that the technology they were supposed to cover had changed in some nature. Uh, that progress along those dimensions were really helping. Um, good. Is this the uh, and I've and I've got a bunch of like young entrepreneurs. There's one who did a, the the sweeper device, which sort of goes along the the canals in Amsterdam and yeah. is picking picking up and compressing materials. I, uh, I've got a few things like that. Different kinds of pollution <laughs> collection inventions. Yeah, um, it's the same fellow. He's also the guy who's done the uh, uh, he's still trying, he's failed a couple of times, but he won't give up, uh, to encircle and collect the, uh, what's it called? Pacific gyre. Uh, yes, yes. yes. Uh, he's had uh, increasing <coughs> success on each attempt. I think this is the third attempt. And he, he, each time he fails and makes reports and gets publicity, he gets even more money from uh, caring benefactors to uh, to try again bigger bigger scale yeah yeah wonderful in the, uh, um, ex his his endeavors are a wonderful example uh, to to, uh, to 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 illustrate the, uh, the what can be done and the power of positive thinking and, and so on exactly yeah. Um, so I've got, uh, let me just, uh, blah, blah, blah. here's, um, let me just share screen again. Ba, ba, da, ba. So here's the North Pacific gyre, marine debris, pollution from plastic, uh, et cetera. And then here's a giant floating trash collector heads for the Pacific garbage patch, uh, is one of the articles I collected, Boyan Slot. That's the man. That's, That's the, the man. man. And he's got a project called the Ocean Cleanup which is probably That's the one you were it. just talking about. Um, sure. the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, they call exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so harvesting marine debris is basically, uh, mm -hmm. and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect this to the North Pacific Pacific Gyre and, uh, <clears throat> did I just do that or not? That's weird. There we go, so it did do it. And then here's, right uh, here's marine debris. Yep. I read also somewhere that 70% of the plastics in the ocean is from fishing boats. Mm -hmm. uh, fishing Boat. nets is, is, are terrible. Most of it is fishing nets. <coughs> right. I mean, plastic straws and, and uh, microplastics from face creams are minuscule. <laughs> the, the volume of them is, is minuscule com uh, compared to the volume of plastics from other sources. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just adding lost fishing nets are a major ocean pollutant, which, cause I didn't have that. And then I'm gonna go back to marine debris. Here's harvesting marine debris. My poor computer is my fan is on and I'm doing zoom plus the brain plus too many tabs open and there we go. So here's, so now I'm, here's marine debris yeah. and now I'll connect it to the thought I just put in. Uh, here we go. So now I drag from this little circle, I connect it to lost fishing nets or a major ocean pollutant. <clears throat> Excuse me. There we go. Uh, and then here's the general topic of microplastics and sea creatures, which is a big deal uh, and so forth. And, and I, think there's a, I think there's a bunch of interesting stories of creative, creative uses of pollutants, uh, creative remediation. Um, there was a, a, a Paul Stamets, who's the fungus expert. Uh, he did a, a talk years ago where he did some bioremediation using fungi. <clears throat> And uh, I'm forgetting which, which one of these presentations that might've been. <clears throat> I'd have to go back and look at it. I think it's six ways mushrooms can save the world. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, 
And basically he had six piles of dirt, I'm making up the numbers here, but he had six piles of dirt that were full of uh, damaged, you know, rare earths or mineral pollution or, or chemical pollution or other kinds of things. And he then used six different methods to try to fix the, the contamination in the piles. One of, one of was that he, he inoculated the pile with um, mycelia. And when he came back a year later or whatever it was, I don't remember the whole experiment, when he came back, basically there were birds nesting on that pile. Dave, great to see you. Uh, and when he came back, there were birds nesting on that pile because the mycelia had broken down the minerals. Uh, a couple of seeds had sort of landed on the soil, which was now generative. A little bit of grass had grown and then some birds figured it out and ate the seeds and sat down and made a nest. Yep. And things like that are really cool. Hey, Dave, so trying to collect up short snippets that would convince a center right ish person with an open mind uh, that there's a huge change afoot. And what 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 might we all do together uh, to, to make that change happen? Like so including including kind of radical ideas like, you know, we're entering a society of abundance, not scarcity, and we need to change. You know, we need to flip some bits. So how to think about abundance, uh, big proposals for public policy shifts that might change other sorts of things. Yeah, basically an epiphany generator. I like that. Or an epiphany garden uh, where somebody could bump into things and start, uh, start thinking about like, how does this all work? Yeah, what a great question. Thank you. I mean, I, so, my, my experience has been that I feel like in the last couple of years, I've had an epiphany. Yeah. Like I kind of saw the regeneration thing and that's the word I use and it's a different thing. And it fundamentally, you know, like it is the new paradigm book minister Fulmer talked about kind of, and, and I kind of, I know the day I had the epiphany. And then when I look at it, it took like 10 years to get to that day kind of. So yeah, you know, it was building up <clears throat> all the EDF experience and stuff, Jerry, you know, but, but then you know, like, I walked around with Mark Barash on a day and he was telling these stories and the light went off, you know, but if I hadn't had the previous 10 years, I don't think the light would have ever gone off. So I, I just don't know how to get to these epiphany generators, but I would love to create one. Exactly. And I've just renamed the thought in my brain to the great transition epiphany garden. <laughs> and the other piece of it has just been like, you know, like we did with, with singing Frog's Farm is like, if you visit one of these places, yes, it's, it's really visceral. You kind of like, oh, and so that, that helps, but, but I don't and so Dave and his wife invited me along to a visit to a sustainable or regenerative farm north of uh, uh, Sebastopol, which was awesome. I just loved that visit. And, and my major takeaway from the visit was when you go regenerative in the middle of industrial agriculture, you make enemies in town. Like you have just made enemies of the dude that sells John Deere, the dude that sells fertilizer, the dude that sells seeds, uh, you know, everybody who sells equipment that all the industrial farmers are busy relying on. And these are, by the way, the wealthy people in town because farming is set up now so that farmers are kept poor and everybody in the supply chain is making a really nice cut and taking more of your hide, right? And, and so, so there's a social dilemma with going regenerative that's, that, that, that is addressable, right? Because these poor people, like all the, we looked at the neighboring farms, which were all row cropping nobody around them was 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 doing what they were doing and then and then she tells this great story about how there were really bad rainstorms and some, lots of flooding uh last last rainy season and one of her neighbors had called saying are you okay we're about to evacuate do you need any help and she's sitting by the fireplace reading because her land is really absorbent and there's like not an emergency on their little plot of land and they don't have a lot of land like singing frogs farm is tiny and there's no emergency there because the land is busy like drinking thirstily because we're in a 20 year drought uh, and the neighbors are all you know, in a state of emergency and that doesn't convince the neighbors that maybe they should, they should change. So I got a lot of lessons from that visit, Dave. Um, and so how do we get these sorts of epiphanies recorded? Um, and you know, we could record our own videos of, uh, maybe I should tell this story in one of the like, like videos that I do and put it out but I'm trying to find other people who've done this a lot over and over again, lather, rinse, repeat, and then collect them up so that they're, they're easy to bump into, easy to find. Um, and especially, would it, would it be, go ahead. Um, sorry, would it be important to uh, avoid um, politician bashing? 
I'm I'm searching around on YouTube while you're speaking. So how to counter political lies was my latest search. I see Jimmy Kimmel's got a five minute documentary of uh, Trump's 2000 lies. I haven't watched it, it must be hilarious, but it's bashing Trump. Mm. Uh, now I would love it. We'd probably all enjoy it for five minutes, but there's a huge uh, swath of the, uh, the population who would hate us for, for, for even mentioning it, right? So I think so it's, I think it, I think it's possible to have a corner that's political if it's kind of marked as such, and um, and and if if the pieces are actually sort of genuinely making a point rather than just bashing, um, and, and if they make a, a good point and happen to say, and by the way, this is the opposite of what these politicians are doing or saying, I think that's totally fine. Uh, but but it may need to be um, trigger warned, uh, you know, yeah. trigger la trigger labeled, so that if people hit it who are fans of those, you know, voted for those politicians and would react badly, hit it, that they're able to, you know, maybe listen to it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, which is where humor often comes in well, but, but I will say that, you know, uh, 10 years ago, I was lamenting that our best reporters seem to be John Stewart and, and uh, John Oliver. And, like our best, our best journalists seem to be like comedians who were making the very best points. Um, I remember when, when W, gave a state of the union talk and was coming up the aisle, you know, shaking hands. And John Stewart did a voiceover analysis of that state of the union talk. And at the beginning, he's really funny. He's like, cause W liked to give everybody nicknames. So he says, Hey, Hey Brownie. Hey, Hey round face. Hey, whatever. And he's making up all these nicknames for the different like Congress critters he's shaking hands with. But then his analysis of the talk was the best analysis I saw done after that state of the union talk. Like what he says after the funny part, is really dead on and very good analysis. So that so so, let's find more of those. And I think that there's probably I'm just realizing John Oliver's 15 minute or half hour segments on one topic, because uh, he takes you know he takes this week tonight to, to to on one topic deep every time. Some of those have to be in this collection as well. Um, mm -hmm. Acknowledging that the right side of the political spectrum is probably allergic to John Oliver and John Stewart and the left spot. The left's uh, comedians, uh, maybe not so much Bill Maher because he's strangely sort of in the middle. Um, but but that might be really useful. And I haven't gone through sort of the, the larger collection of John Oliver's pieces uh, to 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 pick them out. I'm also trying to find short segments inside of longer pieces. Uh, the idea then being because it's really easy on YouTube to send somebody a link with an offset. It's you know ampersand t equals number of seconds, and you're there. And there's when you do, when you hit the share button, you just check the little box that says start at this moment, you know, start at this timestamp and you're, you're in business. So the idea there being, if I can send you into an hour, one of these long duration, hour and a half podcasts, but I can give you a 10 minute snippet that's really vital. You might then rewind to the start and listen to the whole thing. And that's a win. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, but you're unlikely to get there if the first 15 minutes are the host saying, hey, here's our our intro, our noisy musical intro and uh, promoting the next couple shows. And then finally, here's our guest. And then finally we get somewhere. Um, and then solar punk and also um, Afrofuturism, um, ecofeminism. Uh, there's a, there, there are a whole bunch of uh, until recently kind of marginalized ways of looking at the world in the future that are really interesting um, that I think are, are very useful here. So, so like in solar punk, um, are there pieces we can point to? And part of the problem with having a, a, a brief call about this is that really, once we start talking about this and getting good ideas, this is part of the reason why I booked two calls for today. And, and I think I, I wanna repeat this, thing, this exercise is that we then need to go away and go, oh gosh, okay, let's do some research and find a couple snippets and then contribute them into the, to the chat. Uh, maybe I should create a new channel in the Mattermost uh, called Epiphany Garden or something like that. Would that make sense? And then we can sort of share links there. Um, that might work. And let me stop talking so you can all jump in. Because I'm excited about this, sorry. Well, listening to, to what you're saying as a sort of outsider, because I don't live in the States and I don't 
I have no reference points for for the uh, left wing uh, comics that uh, yeah. uh, that you mentioned, and most of what I know about America is filtered through my hour a day watching uh, CNN. Which and and you also happen to live in a high functioning country. Well. <laughs> that's that's another discussion altogether. Yeah, but, there is yeah, okay, that. Uh, but from my CNN bubble, when they are showing, uh, uh, let's let's say uh, Trump supporters and and those various people you would like to get into dialogue with, uh, they are so fanatic they can be triggered by two wrong words or by the wrong nuance of, and I, I'll come back to what Craig was saying, because I, I think that's really, really a big danger of uh, triggering people, even when you're not bashing a politician or not bashing their cherished values, they'll hear things which you don't <coughs> intend. So I'm wondering if there shouldn't be this project or initiative done on several levels. And one <coughs> level is definitely preaching to the converted people in OGM. Right. And people in OGM can really enjoy the, the different uh, snippets and, and, and short videos that people are, are, are going to contribute and come up with and maybe synthesize a kind of message that won't too easily be reinterpreted because looking at those people, Trump supporters and, and MAGA people and people who love the big lie, it's going to be very difficult to get past the many uh, armadillo shells uh, around their thinking. Yes. So to make it short, my suggestion is think about doing it in two or three levels and then testing the middle level. <laughs> the OGM preaching to the converted level, then a kind of synthesis level where some best guesses are, are uh, distilled from all the great things that, that are put together and then testing it somehow. Um, agreed. And, and, and I think, um, I mean, to my mind, the, the, greatest, the greatest instrument in, in social change is somebody taking somebody else by the hand to try something new. Mm -hmm. And usually the person who grabs the other person's hand needs to be pretty similar yep. to the person who's being, who's undergoing the change. Cause if they're too different, they won't listen to them. They won't, you know, it doesn't really work um, unless something really unusual has happened. So one of my heroes uh, is uh, Daryl Davis, who's a, a black jazz musician who has a garage full of KKK robes because many years ago he was playing boogie woogie in a, in a bar and a white guy came up and sat at the piano and said, hey, I've you know, never heard a white guy play Jerry, I mean, a black guy play Jerry Lee Lewis so well. And Davis says, well, I kind of, you know, helped Lewis learn some piano. Uh, and it's like, whoa. And it turns out two years, it turns out that this guy is a KKK grand wizard. And it turns out that two years later, they've invited each other to each other's homes and the wizard retires out of the KKK and gives Daryl his robe. Two Thanks. years later, two years later, and, and Daryl's whole lesson is that listening with respect, even if you disagree with somebody, and even if they appear to be your mortal enemy, is really powerful. And I love, I love that lesson, right? To me, that's a huge lesson. But, but that took showing up and being vulnerable and being patient and being respectful and a bunch of other things that, that, that are really difficult. Um, but I, but I want to put you know, uh, one of Daryl Davis's talks in here as well. I should totally do that. Um, so, so, so I think a piece of our conversation here is how to structure the garden so that there are different le levels yeah. of reveal or layers of access or trigger warnings, or I don't know what to call it, but, but, you know, how to design this so that people who are like, okay, I got this, I'm with the program. I'm convinced that racism, for instance, is a big problem and we need to make progress on it. What do we do? And that's, that's the, that's the, the easy layer. And then there's the skeptics layer. Uh, and, and, and part of my problem with this intellectually is, God, and I think that this is fine because if we provide resources, other people can provide the human connection. But I think that, this, that, that the, 
one person taking the other by the hand part is missing when it's just a collection online. If, if it's just a bunch of artifacts somewhere on a website or in a brain or in an OGM, whatever, or in a wiki, great, who cares? Um, how do we, but then that those kinds of nuggets are the exact kind of viral things that then float through communities and change people's minds. Yeah. And, and the far right has figured all this out, like with Pepe the Frog gifts, right? Like during the election cycle, the far right was busy on, on, eight, on 8chan or Infinity Chan going, hey, who's got the coolest Pepe the Frog thing that we're going to make go viral today because we've built an echo chamber. And if we point to each other, suddenly the, the left is going to be showing everybody in the world this, this Pepe meme, which is really like underhanded, but hey, that's publicity and how, that's how we're going to win this election. So that's the same thing. It's like ideas going viral through communities and they figured out how that works. Um, Stacy, go ahead. Because this is brainstorming, I feel yeah. like I could say anything, even if it's a little outrageous. But so for me, the best way would be if people were creating this together. So when you first started talking, my head went to, wouldn't it be great to um, invite a group of, whether they be educators or students, which are diverse in nature, and put them on teams of three, allowed them access to your resources, and sort of had a contest where they create something. Now you have people that are already, they're the same, but they're different, but they're working to grip together to create the most balanced educational video that could later be used somewhere else. Uh, yeah. Now you have those diverse people putting out their own product. And we already know from that COVID article that 12 people were responsible for all that, for most of that misinformation. So if we could switch that and use it to the positive, we get 12 people on board that are, you know, they've worked together to get there and they've built relationships on the way. And there's this, you know, okay, I'll stop. That was great. No, terrific. Go yeah, on. That's perfect. <laughs> that's really good. Yeah, yeah. And 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 how do you what? governor mechanism do you apply to these groups what goal do you give them that orients them back back toward the regenerative future as opposed to slipping just over the event horizon down the rabbit hole of QAnon and other kinds of conspiracy theories which are sort of doing the opposite right because because it would be a very fruitful exercise to sit down and collect up QAnon videos that support you know crazy points of view to do exactly the same exercise uh, in the wrong direction. That's entertaining well, and doable as well. What I try to do just in my life with conversations is I try to, those crazy points of view, I try to look at them instead of fighting them, say, let's imagine this is true. Right. What could we do? How could we use it to our advantage? Right. So it's just like reframing. And one, one, one argument also that works sometimes with extreme points of view is to, is to take them further to the extreme and say, well, if that's true, if that really is true, then it's going, it's pointing here. And is that even possible? Is that a, you know, how does that world work? Uh, but again, like that. that's what, that's what we normally do. And yeah. that's still pushback. I'm saying don't push back. Like, for example, <laughs> I can't even give you examples. Some of these things are just so crazy what people yeah. are thinking. But I, I think I mentioned it yesterday just with the um, extended unemployment. Mm -hmm. How I just reframe those conversations to look at the positive. So the wages are going up. You know, in the, you know, there's a reason they need people. Make them pay more. Those are good things. Those are not bad things. And when people tell me to wake up and they're talking about COVID, I tell them to wake up and stop thinking you were born to work for $10 an hour, 50 hours a week. That's right. where you have to wake. So I'm agreeing with them, but I'm saying, hold on, there's more. There could be something good in that. Yeah, exactly. And you're opening really interesting questions like, how do you leave things at hand when the conversation has gone down a twisty path into really strange theories? Like, how do you, how do you reach those people uh, and ask the kinds of questions you just asked, Stacey. <laughs> so yesterday, somebody posted something and it was one of these, hmm, and they were drawing, the hmm was about um, this, the hacking of the, of the meat plant. 
and how yeah. Bill Gates, Bill Gates is buying up all the farmland. So, hmm, that must mean he's behind it. Right. And I just couldn't pass it. I tried to pass it. And what I did is I just kind of made a joke and I said, okay, so who is responsible for the MTA attack? And somebody said, Elon Musk. And I just put like a, <laughs> a laugh face. Um, and it, it was enough. And that person, the first person who I know, you know, I knew her from high school. Yeah. She didn't go back at me because she real. it was one of her allies that made the joke because if, that's what I'm trying to say. Even people within the group realize that some of their friends are a little too far gone. Yes. And that's where humor, you know, like I'm not, I mean, they know who I am. So they mm -hmm. already know that I don't agree with a lot of what they're saying, but they also think I'm pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. So it kind of stopped the conversation. And, and I do plan on going back and I, on another site, somebody put something about, Another, hmm, and this was about why, why, are, why is the government paying people to get the COVID vaccine? And that one I'll go back and I'll answer really nicely because you know some of these people I know for 30 years, mm -hmm. but they're just, they have really not seen how, in my opinion, they haven't seen how manipulated they've been by mm -hmm. propaganda. And that's the really weird thing about QAnon, for example, is that the, I think a big reason it exists is that it acknowledges and preys on the fact that we've been manipulated by propaganda and by all kinds of stuff. And it's like, yes, that's right. And then it routes you down the rabbit hole of some really crazy ass theories. And you're like, oh, okay, not that, not that stuff. But, but, but the hook, the hook really um, is, is stuff that makes, makes a lot of sense that we would probably agree with. That, that's like the opening salvo is it, it, it and is stuff that normal politicians are busy denying or avoiding. I mean, the fact that Donald Trump is almost the only major politician who said that Bush was lying when he led us into the Iraq war, right? I'm like, please, why did nobody else say this? Like, like could y'all just be brave and, 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 and like make that statement so I don't have to say that Trump is one of the few politicians who like put that out there? Uh, and it's like, ah. Uh, anyway, um, so I we feel like you were saying it earlier, Jerry, around the, the I kind of, I don't know how many dimensions there are to this question. Yeah, but one, lots. it's got to be some kind of like continuum, like how close are they on you? It's, uh, close to you on the scale are they, right? And so the, you know, the QAnon folks, and I've kind of given up trying to interact with a whole bunch of my old high school friends because they're just too cray cray. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, I don't know what to do with this stuff. And you know, you end up with it's the end of times, and thank God, God's coming to kill us all. You know, it's like okay, I don't know what to do with that. So, yeah, yeah. so I'm not going to deal with that end of the scale. Well, I actually got really frustrated with all my friends who were like really devoted to climate activism, and the entire world has to change because of climate. Right. It's like, well, yeah, but but what about all the other things? You know, don't we have to fix more than one thing at a time? And so, I actually think they're kind of a group that I would love to have more influence on. Um, so anyway, I, I do think there's a continuum and there must be multiple issues. Yeah. And then one of the things you made me think when you were talking a little bit earlier is that there probably are like dimensions. To me, they're part of my epiphany. My epiphany came on several dimensions, I think. Yeah. And I wonder if you could almost attack them one by one. So the abundance thing, you know, the fact that things can have positive some outcomes. I just felt like all my economics background was, didn't, didn't include that kind of thinking, you know? Right, and right. so um, I, um, a living systems versus engineered system, right? Kind of like, a, you know, the systems dynamic stuff. Um, yeah. that, so I do feel like there, we probably could set, you know, identify, you know, maybe they're little epiphanies or something that you kind of, and if, if you, when you bring them all together, then you get like a really fundamental change, but you can actually kind of tackle them one by one. Um, exactly. Uh, that you're, you're exactly on the spirit of what I'm trying to curate here. Uh, um, what I'm hoping we curate together here is is a series of epiphanies that that unlock different ways of seeing. And you're reminding me that I've got a bunch of thoughts in my brain about stupid wars we're fighting, like the war on drugs and a bunch of other. It's like, can we stop treating these things as wars? And some of the videos that are already in the collection, there's two of them on poverty that are really brilliant. It's like it's like how we're thinking about poverty is ass backwards. It's just wrong. And and if you listen to the talk, you'd be like, oh, okay. So there's like major social problems going on. Uh, and then I have an allergy to 
people who show up and say, the dominant problem in the world is X and we all need to you know, drop everything and focus only on X. And it's like, and let's pretend that that's you know, climate change mitigation. Um, and it's like, uh, yes, except we can't pass any legislation because trust is broken. And, and unless we address trust somehow, we'll, we'll make no progress on this other thing. And, and like, like you said, Dave, I think we need to work in, in everywhere at once. And, and a piece of what I'm hoping OGM does is we figure out how to help everybody who, who's making sense move together forward or move forward together. Um, and Dave, are you on the Mattermost chats? You know, I'm not following them very much. I, I okay. In the, in the, uh, that's fine. We're using, um, I'll, I'll put a link in the Zoom uh, to the channel that we're using in case you want to go there. We've been paraphrasing you in this chat, but I'm trying to centralize the chat over uh, over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that we, so that we have a continuous conversation on this topic. And I'm, uh, is it too early for me to spawn a different channel in the matter most around this question, or should we keep it in the calls channel? Anybody have a strong feeling about this? No strong feelings. Okay. Then it's probably too early. So let's just use the, the, that channel, the call, the OGM calls channel, uh, for this conversation. Um, and then, I feel like the little lone gardener because I've been feeding one brain file for 23 years. I feel like the, the lone termite that's pure, that's feeding the fungus in the, you know, under the hive. And it's been frustrating because the brain is not that good at multi-person curating and we don't have other kinds of media that make it easy except for sharing playlists on YouTube or other sort of conventional tools. So, so I'm interested in, in sort of clever hacks of, of that. Um, that said, Apparently, the technology exists to make things go viral and to, to you know, get ideas propagated across the world for cheap. So, so that's that's all doable, I guess. Apropos your uh, aversion, Jerry, to uh, people who say, <laughs> no, screw all that. This is the most important thing. And this goes to uh, uh, what Stacy raised um, a few days ago. Media, the news, the right hand, the, 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 the right wing news and the, the <clears throat> misinformation on, on social media. It's such a damaging aspect of what's coming into half of the brains in the, in the Western world. You can't, surely you can't really deal with anything in a constructive way if you're not dealing with the facts. Um, I found another video I want to watch. It's a, a discussion on BBC about whether it should, or if it's even possible, to make it illegal for politicians to lie. I, I, don't, I, I don't know what that conversation in, in, in involves. I haven't, haven't heard it, but the, uh, the, the, the subject is uh, of primary importance in, in my mind. I mean, some of the things that was it, it was about a week ago, some of these Republican politicians in, in, in the States are talking about January 6th was a, a regular tourist visit. It was and, like a tourist visit, and, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, Lies, 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 the blackest, bold faced, most horrible, destructive lies. Yeah. You can, and, and millions of people are sucking this in as well, God's gospel. How the hell are we ever going to deal with people who believe this stuff? These are people who believe what they're told. They're told it often enough by the figures they watch on TV thanks, Dave. And, the, and the voices they hear on, uh, on, on talk radio. Yep. They believe what they're told. So, so let me let me put a different a different spin on what you just said, sure, right? sure. which is which is that um, for me, misinformation, disinformation, all that is actually a strategy, is a tactic, is a technique, is a method, um, mm -hmm. and and it doesn't mean that the people uttering these things are stupid. It means that they've decided it's okay to do this because situation is so desperate that you're going to have to lie like a rug in order to change the course of the conversation and prevent, for instance, an actual commission from saying that five Congress people should be indicted for crimes because they were busy 
you know, because it turns out that their phone records show that they were talking to the people in the crowd, directing them into the building, for example, which I think might actually be true, right? And an and, and investigation might actually indict Trump of uh, incitement uh, to riot, et cetera, et cetera. And clearly they don't want that because they've all drunk the Trump Kool-Aid. So these are all measured lies that are done without, not because they're dumb and they, they, they've they been fooled into believing this, but because mm -hmm. they believe this is their only option is to lie this way. And so therefore one of the lies is we just have to minimize January 6th and convince people that this was normal. And so we gaslight by saying this was just like a tourist visit and people buy it, not because they're too dumb to see that there was like a riot and windows were broken and people were hurt, but rather because that if, if we can just convince everybody that that narrative is true, then we might still win some elections. And there's a, there's a titanic battle on the ground in the US right now between a party that appears to be clearly racist and has figured out that if elections are fair, they will never like win a majority again and be able to control legislation and the, ju ju the judiciary and whatever else. And another party that's like not smart enough about the tools and methods uh, to do things, but is fighting over whether to break like things like the filibuster right now in order to drive more legislation and stop this, this insidious process from happening. And, and, and one of my motives for this quest on the Epiphany Garden is to try to steer clear of today's combat on the streets, like I just described, and to move us toward the horizon where we can talk about, oh, if you switch your brain from scarcity to abundance, these interesting things happen to you. And oh, if you start thinking about equity differently um, and about poverty differently, other programs will make sense to you now. And, and th to pull us away from this really like knife fight in an elevator which is what I think is happening right now politically, um, out into a place where it's easier to talk about, about the horizon and what happens over the horizon together um, and where people might be able to you know, agree on those sorts of things with, without going toward, we just need world peace and here's a rosy, you know, all crystals, all singing future, which, which I think you know, is great, is, is, but, but isn't, isn't tangible, doesn't give you things, ways to shift your thinking, things to, things to do. Yeah, there's certainly more profit in in focusing on uh, on how good the future can be if we do this and that, rather than focus on how awful it's going to be if we don't do. Exactly. You, you just get defensiveness exactly. to to that, that, that. That's a kind of attack. But the other the other form is inspirational. Exactly. There's a piece of this that I'm really looking for and haven't. I, I wasted a lot of time sort of throwing away videos because I just couldn't find this nugget. But there, there are a whole bunch of initiatives in the world trying to change a flip a bit in humans so that we stop seeing ourselves as separate individuals competing for scarce resources mm -hmm. and start seeing ourselves as completely interdependent and needing to figure out how to keep the, the pale blue dot you know, uh, so that it's fruitfully feeding us all and not like falling apart. But th the shift from ownership to stewardship, the shift from private property and private rights to social uh, sort, of, sort of things, flipping that bit so that people start seeing each other as necessary to each other, right? Rather than as competitors for, for scarce resources. And I haven't found those nuggets very easily. Um, and there's a bunch of people doing heavy, heavy lifting on this. And there's lots of movements trying to cause that shift toward, you know, from independence to interdependence, uh, you know, declarations of interdependence. There's several of those out. Um, and, I, and I'd love to discover what the, where those little nuggets are, where the shiny bits are of somebody explaining that really well. Because I think those are, those are like high leverage pieces in the middle of this puzzle. Yeah. Does OGM have a, a YouTube channel? So I had a, a, a person I didn't know wrote me a couple months ago and said, hey, I noticed that all the OGM videos are going out on your private channel. There should be an OGM channel. And right this moment, OGM is trying to stand itself up as a bit of an entity, like a, a, an entity with some legal structure, which I'm in the middle of. Um, and one of the questions there is, should there be an OGM, separate OGM Gmail account? And that would imply then a YouTube channel and stuff like that. The answer to that is probably yes. But it's kind of complicated enough in my that I don't want to complicate my life until that actually is done well and and necessary. And I understand how to share 
a business account, right? Uh, and that should probably be a Google suite account. And then that means paying some money to Google and, and a couple other things, I think. Uh, so the, answer, the short answer is not yet, um, but I think it's imminent and necessary. And I would, you know, anybody who's got lots of wisdom on that, I'd love to pick their brain. Uh, I'm not that one. <laughs> <laughs> I recognize the value of YouTube. You have to reach the people where they are. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Uh, I selectively use YouTube about two hours a week. So I'm no yeah. expert. And I, I waste way too much time on YouTube. Uh, did you know that YouTube is the world's second most popular search engine? Oh, is it? So the first one's Google. Google won that race still. Uh, but the second most popular, also owned by Google, of course, is YouTube. People use YouTube like a general purpose search engine. Mm -hmm. yep. And it works pretty well because somebody poured like everything in the world into YouTube, right? Um, and so you'll find stuff. And if you, if you want to figure out how to tie a bow tie or why your left hip is hurting or how to, I was trying to figure out the, the closet door that's right next to me, the hinge was broken and I just looked at it and I just couldn't figure out how to repair it. And within, within a couple of minutes, I'd found exactly the video I needed. And I'm like, oh, oh, I do that. Okay, good. Same thing happened to our refrigerator door handle. The, the bottom popped out and I'm like, how do I? Video, done. So, so people, are, people are, have learned uh, how to use these things pretty well. Um, and, and one of the things that gives me hope is that people have learned how to use simple instruments like Pinterest, Instagram, uh, et cetera, with hashtags in very sophisticated ways. And there are communities that are doing really cool stuff just by harnessing hashtags and, and filtering sort of interesting stuff across their community. That's really cool. And I think that's a piece of this. And I think that some of the videos I need to include are from people like Dana Boyd, and other sociologists who've done a really nice job of examining the influences of social media in our society, good and bad, uh, but they see more of the good than some of the critics see. So I think I need to go turn over those rocks a little bit. Yeah. Yes, please, Stacey. So for me, one of the elements that social media addresses is this ability of people to be able to connect and participate, even if it's just in a very small way. And uh, so I, all right, this is this is the pie in the sky kind of brainstorming now, because cool. I keep having somebody who keeps saying, create great art, create great art. And I have it in my head over and over and it gets me crazy. I live in a town, Nyack, New York, that would be the perfect test situation for what you were talking about when you were talking about that economy and the tokens. And the reason I say it would be perfect, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. It's small, which makes yeah. kind of a difference because you can contain certain things, but it's progressive, it's diverse, and most importantly, it's creative. And there is, already so many interconnections in my community that if framed right, there's no doubt that we could get people on board and then it could be filmed. And then we've created something and we're doing it. You know, like to me, that's what Facebook did. I didn't know what Facebook was when I first went on it. I'll stop because I could get overly excited. <laughs> so I, I love that. And I, and I, I love I want you to get more excited about that. Uh, so uh, one of my friends and heroes is Arthur Brock, um, mm -hmm. who is the founder of the Holo chain, Holo movement, et cetera. But before that, for 25, 30 years, he was working with a couple of colleagues on something uh, called, uh, oh, heck, what was it called? Um, I'll find it in my brain. Um, oh man, it's always, it's always easy for me to remember and now it's gone. Anyway, um, the Meta Currency Project, there we go. Mm -hmm. And, and it ran really, really deep. And I had several long conversations with him and uh, Eric Harris Braun and uh, 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 their third collaborator, collaborator Jean-Francois Nubel. So the three of them basically were, were, were coding and thinking very, very deeply about these things. Then at some point uh, a decade ago, uh, somebody who owned a cardboard mill on the Hudson donated it to them temporarily because it was derelict, nobody was in there. And they went and they started a school 
and they invented basically um, uh, agile learning centers, ALCs, and uh, ELL, the uh, uh, a bunch of sort of sort of like fast learning things that apply apply agile to learning in a in a business sort of setting, and they invented a bunch of stuff, put it out in the world, um, and and. Other people then across the US and I think in other countries have picked up the Agile Learning Center model, which is an add water and stir, build your own little school kind of thing, uh, which is really cool, right? Sort of instructions. And I'm a little sad that Arthur's last seven, 10 years have been kind of hijacked by this whole chain thing, because what they discovered, I think, was when blockchain got really famous and big and started taking over the world a few years ago, they realized that whole, that they could split off a piece of the meta currency project and go launch this thing they called Holochain and that it would make more sense than blockchain. And then a whole bunch of reality happened and they've, there's, I think they're a little stuck in trying to make Holochain an actual platform that can in fact compete with blockchain and do all the things that it promises to do because reality got in the way in lots of places. But there's a whole string of really interesting ideas and thinking that came out of Arthur's work in particular, there's a video he shot years ago about Bessie the cow. Any of you have seen this? It's an explanation of value and he's unpacking value. And my, my own interpretation of Arthur's riff on, on Bessie the cow and value, he talks about how Bessie in the marketplace is worth $1,228 worth of steaks and blood and bones and whatever. Like that's what Bessie's worth. But Bessie was also the best milk producer in the herd. But Bessie was also his favorite cow. And, 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 he, and he basically unpacks lots of layers of value that Bessie had, which the modern economy compresses into dollar value, right? Because you buy and sell, you, you take Bessie to the auction, you sell her and they cut her up into, 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 into bones and bits. Um, but this idea that we've compressed value to me is one of these aha little moments about, oh, why don't we let value breathe and stop making, and, and for me, one of my favorite videos is, one of my favorite books is The Great Transformation by Carl Polanyi, which was written in 1944. Uh, uh, and it's a description of life from pre-industrial to early industrial society. And he's talking about, partly about how in pre-industrial society, everything didn't have a price. Like, most of us stayed alive without having to earn money to stay alive. Most of us stayed alive because we were householding, which means you planted potatoes and carrots and had chickens in the backyard and you had a pig. And when you slaughtered the pig, you shared the pig out with your neighbors because when the Joneses killed their pig, everybody ate too. And there weren't refrigerators and freezers, right? So you could salt or smoke, but et cetera. And, and, and he talks about that process and, and how modern assumptions ate our brains. And, and he talks about how three fictitious commodities, and I did a short video on this that I should put in the garden because uh, he talks about how the industrial revolution creates three fictitious new commodities, land, labor, and money. And it isn't that land, labor, and money didn't exist before, but you couldn't go down to century 21 real estate and buy a plot of land because it belonged to the church or the king or was inherited or whatever. Like there wasn't a free market for, for, for property for land. Um, there wasn't a labor force. People were uh, apprenticed or tied to a feudal lord or there wasn't a free labor force that could pick up and go take your job at the factory. And then everything didn't have a price. There were coins, but they were kind of exceptional. And if you read Graeber's book, Debt, um, and you, you read sort of, he, the first thing he does is debunk the, the myth that economists love that money exists because it replaced barter. He's like, within a village, there was very little barter. People stayed alive in these other ways that he describes, uh, reciprocity, redistribution, and householding. Um, and so all of that comes together into this story that, that, that is how the modern narrative ate our lives back around 1750. And that through all of history before that, the implication is through all of history before that, humans lived together and stayed alive in, in different ways where everything didn't have a price and all the things we take for granted now didn't exist, right? And it's, it's a bit, Stacey, what you were saying earlier that, that you, know, you don't have to work like 80 hour work weeks and devote all your labor to the thing. And like, like that model is something that we were sold that is now up for renegotiation. And, and so for me, one of the exciting quests right now is, hey, if we're renegotiating the social contract in several different ways, what does that turn into next? And, and so the quest here for epiphanies is a way of feeding that conversation, is a way of feeding our explorations into 
what are the next viable contracts at the social level, which is sort of geopolitical and sort of economic, and at the enterprise level, which is what is a company, what is for-profit, non-profit, what model should the company use? How does value make its way around all of this? Uh, and, and what are the value models in all of this that nurture the thing we share, the commons between us? Sorry, that was kind of a long, a long rant, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to talk my way through. This is like the talking cure. Um, trying to talk my way through why do this and how does it fit and what is the broader philosophical conversation that is necessary so that these things hang together in uh, in a new narrative, in a new web of ideas. Yes. I just want to highlight what you just said about the talking cure and talking your way through, because I think we need to afford that to other people to start thinking about what is it they really think? Because like what Craig was saying, I, I kind of agree. There are certain, I don't think they're too dumb, but I think there's no thinking involved. It's like a, just a de default setting. Right. So I think we just have to create an environment where we allow people to talk a little bit more. You know, like I said, well, so if you think that, you know, this was Antifa on January 6th, don't you want a commission to find out? Let's find out, you know, right. like just, I think we need to listen to people more is what I'm saying. And not, I, I don't mean the voices that are already out there because those voices made it to, made it to the top for a reason, but exactly. I'm talking about the ones that are feeling stifled, which is who Trump tapped into. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, so we've gone almost an hour and a half. Uh, we should probably wrap at the half or before. Uh, I'm happy to, well, certainly let's continue this on the chats, on the, on the calls channel in Mattermost. There's another call today at four if anybody wants to rejoin and if you want to recruit anybody else to come, come in. Um, and totally open to any suggestions for how to go about this quest. Um, I will continue to update my brain around this thought and, you know, uh, post that in the Mattermost chat so we can sort of circle, circle around there. There are plenty of other ways to manifest this list. Um, and maybe an interesting thing is to create a, an Instagram channel. I don't really like Instagram, but, but maybe that there's an interesting path here to put this conversation somewhere else and create a feed that we can sort of uh, continually yeah. drop interesting things into. I don't know. Um, I like the idea of a multi-tiered, multi-ringed uh, garden where uh, people who are at different stages in this process can find materials that are resonant for them and that don't cause them to bounce out of the garden entirely. Because I'm all too aware that <clears throat> when the entity that's trying to tell you something is too different from you and is saying something that's too contrarian to your belief systems, your very likely reaction is to jump out the door and pull the ripcord. Um, and I just tell an anecdote about that because I thought of it during listening to, to uh, part of the conversation earlier. Yes, please. Uh, well, living in, in Europe, I, I was born in America, but I've lived more than 50 years in, in Europe. And I, I don't think I understand much about what's been going on in America in the last 20 or, or 30 years. But there was a time when my wife and I went back to America and we did these trips to national parks. And as, as you know, you go into a national park and then there's a, a pullout for cars with a beautiful overlook. So we'd be at some of these taking pictures and near chat and all other kinds of other cars would stop there. And you get into conversation with other people, a lot of Americans, uh, uh, three generations together taking a family vacation. And it was during the period when John Kerry was running against George W. And for, for my point of view, having lived in Europe and my wife as a, as a Dutch woman, we couldn't understand how people could vote again for George 
W. Bush after four years, his first four years, and he's robbing, he's robbing poor people to pay his rich friends. And in a sort of careful way, we might broach this conversation. And the answer we got over and over again was, well, you're, you're right, he's stealing from us and he's lying to us and so, but that other guy, he wants the homosexual marriage. How could you ever? So it doesn't matter what George Bush is, is doing to us. Right. Because, and there was one chord in all of the many things that John Kerry was saying that convinced people, and I'm sure it's the same with a lot of the Trump people and the QAnon people. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming back to this, talking cure and also the listening cure. So yeah, yeah. Uh, in this hour and a half, I remembered that and it's a kind of epiphany. It's too bad David's not here. It was an epiphany. Suddenly I understood how people could choose a ver an idiot or, or a criminal uh, because there's something that they value much more deeply. And since I don't have that value set. I can't understand that. So the talking cure, and, and as Stacy, you were saying, you know, getting people to talk and listen with respect, that's a real way forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're also pointing out the unfortunate fact that there are single issue voters on several things, uh, abortion and women's rights, uh, gay marriage and other issues around identity, sexuality, etc., yeah. and guns. Oh, uh, and, and 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 the gun and and the people yeah. on guns are like, you're going to pry the guns out of my hand, out of my cold dead hands, kind of things, you know, Charlton Heston style, and and they're adamant, just adamant, yeah. um, and and those constituencies will consistently vote conservative and form, I think, a, 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 a very hard to move kernel core of the conservative movement, um, which conservatives often go back to and fuel and, and pump that fire. Like they, they pour oxygen on that flame because they know that, that they need to do that. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, I just want to point out, especially with the gun thing, because I've seen this really happen, where people who were not really into guns at all, 10 years later, they are like all for yeah. guns. and. What I want to point out, though, is the role that being part of a community played. And this is what I say to those people that are mocking me and telling me to wake up. What I throw back at them is how they've been manipulated into this gun culture, you know, and how, you know, that, you know, the gun, the gun industry has created the best marketing program to fool you all. And that's how I get into that conversation where we start talking about like, how many guns do you need? Or, well, where did you get all this fear from? Because again, these people are very quick to tell me that I'm living in fear because I choose to get vaccinated. <laughs> so I'm just kind of taking what they already believe about people being manipulated and I'm showing them, well, you know, you need a TV station all about guns. You need accessories <laughs> for guns. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But anyway, the, the point I really wanted to make is that sense of being part of a community. So there are gun groups and that becomes a socialization mechanism. And that's really important. So for that reason, I brought us to this thought in my brain, emotion and membership beat reason most of the time and stories are the vessel. Um, and by which I'm, and my usual explanation of this is, uh, let's pretend OGM is five years more mature and we have tools to present beautiful arguments visually with irrefutable evidence, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And if my argument will cause you to be ostracized by your community, if accepting my, my argument will make you like bounce from your friends, from your communities, from your groups, you will happily <coughs> deny my reality and disagree with me. And in fact, actively voice bullshit uh, you know, from the other side, it's, it's not a problem. And so it, this is connected to another important thought for me, which is this one, that we are in a titanic battle over the narratives in our heads. And in fact, this is my story of civilization, that religions, all those things are all about programming up the stories in our heads, right? Um, and and that, that 
that is why people who design ad campaigns and political campaigns and spin and echo chambers and all of that are so dangerous. Because if you can convince everybody in trickle down economics, you can change all the policies, you can redesign all the systems, you can build stuff uh, that is a prison for the people who suffer. Like, like another thought somewhere else in my brain is like, you do not want to be a peasant pretty much anywhere on earth at any time because the peasants always have the blood squeezed out of them by whoever's in power. Like being a peasant really sucks. And, and just, you know, being a pioneer in America, when you moved west, when you were given, given some land, everybody knew that most of, the, of that land would, didn't get enough rain to do anything and was going to not be productive and that you were going to fail. And then like, and then the railroad would show up and blackmail you because, hey, how else are you going to get your goods to market? Et cetera, et cetera. It's like, like, and then now with Monsanto, which got bought by Bayer and, and, and uh, is trying, you know, uh, there's just, a, there's so many of these and they're layered on top of each other, right? And so, so part of me is really eagerly looking for the, the emotion and membership hacks to the whole system. Because there's a piece of me that's busy trying to say, how do I present, how do I present information in a way that's, that's factual and easy to absorb and build on and, and build logical arguments. And I really think that's important. I wanna do that. And then there's this thought in my brain, which says, yeah, good luck with that. And so I'm always looking for, all right, all right, all right. So how do we appeal to people and bring them by the hand to try something different, right? And, and so I'm, I'm on that a lot. And, and then Hank, back to your story. Just yesterday, I read a long post, might even have been this morning when I first woke up, I think it was yesterday. I'm on, a, I'm on a little mailing list of telecom geeks. And one of them, I think is Dutch, either Dutch or Swedish, I think he's Dutch. Um, and he, he wrote this long post about how when he grew up, America was the hero. And America was a thing that he looked forward to and like America had all the great stuff and all the great social innovations seemed to be coming from America and, and, and how that's flipped. And how in Europe now, you look across the, 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 the pond and it's like, not that much you want to import anymore. Not that much you want to bring in, right? And, and so there's a lot of high functioning institutions, healthcare systems, of course, like so much better, uh, out, health outcomes, all those kinds of things just, just been done better. Uh, and, and in America, we've become sort of jingoistic and xenophobic and uh, all of those kinds of things, partly so that we don't have to look at other high functioning systems, right? Uh, one of the things I discovered, so I, I mentioned that the great transformation is, uh, actually, let me screen share again, because this is fun and then we can wrap the call. Um, TGT, the great transformation is the book. So I'm searching, oops, TDT great, there we go. Um, so uh, years ago, somebody who was a fan, so there's, a, I've, I've got opposite the great transformation, I've got a thought called critiques of TGT. So there's a bunch of critiques here. And then there is uh, here, there's a, 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 a post by Murray Rothbard, who was the head of the Mises Society. So Murray Rothbard is a, is a thinker. Uh, let me just go to him. Uh, he was the head of the Mises Institute. Uh, Ludwig von Mises is one of the Austrian economists who is the sort of the, some of the premises behind libertarianism, right? And so uh, Murray Rothbard writes this letter to his followers at the, Murray, at the Mises Institute. And the letter is titled, Down with Primitivism, A Thorough Critique of Polanyi. And this is my note, full of bile. And when you read this letter, which is a critique of Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, um, what he's trying to do is he's trying to convince all of his followers never to pick up and read this book. Yeah. And he commits in this letter all of the <clears throat> sins that he's accusing Polanyi of committing. He's like, Pol Polanyi's doing this, doing that, and, and every one of those things is something that he's actually actively engaging in in this letter, which is just an attempt to make sure nobody goes and actually calmly reads Polanyi because Polanyi makes a lot of sense. And Polanyi is not saying we should all go back to the noble, savage, Rousseauian world. He's none of that stuff. You know, Polanyi is an economic historian who is busy looking at actual numbers at how the early industrial society fucked us up. And, and at early efforts to compensate for that with poor laws and with a bunch of other things. And he's, he's just chronicling what happened and how dangerous it was. 
And nobody who loves capitalism and thinks libertarianism is the pinnacle of society wants anybody else to read that. Yes. So a lot of, of things on the far right are attempts to make sure that interesting stuff on the other side doesn't get paid attention to, which, I, I, which, is, a, which is a tactic, mm -hmm. right? It's a tactic. Um, so thank you for showing up here. I really it's appreciate fun. it. <laughs> it's been totally, totally, totally fun. I'm going to post this recording to YouTube and then post the link uh, to the calls chat like our normal ones, uh, like our Thursday calls. Uh, I'll, I'll be back on same place, same channel at 4, uh, at 4 p.m. Pacific this afternoon. If anybody, Hank, three hours. you'll be nicely asleep. Right, three but, hours? Three hours from now. Uh, no, it's only 9.31 for me here and that's 4 p.m. So more than three hours from now. Okay, <laughs> Yeah. I'll find it. Um, cool. And, uh, and then we can book another call like this next week or whatever. I'll find out. I'll, I'll make that decision this afternoon. Okay. I, I enjoyed this conversation a lot and, uh, I learned, well, I got all kinds of insights of things I hadn't thought about in that way before. So thanks everyone. That's great. I love that. Thank you. I won't be there, uh, at four Pacific time, but, uh, if there's another call next week when I can make it, I'll check in again i'll make sure one of them is early <laughs> <laughs> okay guys thank you all have a nice have a nice day further and a nice weekend you too bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.